Welcome to our exciting YouTube channel, where knowledge meets entertainment. If you're ready to explore, learn, and be entertained, you've come to the right place. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you never miss an update. Get ready for an incredible journey with us. Let's dive right in. Unraveling the enigmas of the Druidic traditions in Britain and Gaul. The ancient and aboriginal inhabitants of Britain embarked upon a revival and reformation of their national customs in a distant epoch. Previously, their spiritual guides were simply known as Guid. However, circumstances dictated the division of this sacred office into two roles, the national or superior priest and a more limited one. Henceforth, the former was dubbed Darawith, signifying the Druid, or the elevated instructor, and the latter was called Go Wide, or Ovide, representing the Ovate, a subordinate instructor. Together, they were collectively referred to as Bayard, the revered teachers of wisdom. As the system evolved and expanded, the Bardic Order came to encompass three distinct classes, the Druids, Baird Braint, or Privileged Bards, and Ovates, the Ovides. The etymology of the word Druid remains a matter of contention. Max Mola postulates that, much like the Irish term Druid, it conveys the men of the oak trees. He also points out the Greek reference to forest gods and tree deities as dryads. Other theories link the word to Teutonic, Welsh, or Gaelic roots. In the Sanskrit language, Dru signifies timber. During the era of Roman conquest, the Druids were deeply entrenched in the lands of Britain and Gaul. Their sway over the populace was unchallenged, and they possessed the authority to halt armies, even when on the brink of conflict, through the white-robed Druids' intervention. The Druidic order is justly recognized for their profound understanding of nature and her laws. The Encyclopedia Britannica attests to their pursuit of subjects like geography, physical science, natural theology, and astrology. The Druids boasted a foundational knowledge of medicine, particularly in the application of herbs and simples. Archaic surgical instruments have been discovered in England and Ireland. A curious treatise on early British medicine contends that every practitioner was expected to cultivate a garden or yard for the cultivation of essential herbs related to their profession. Eliphas Levi, the eminent transcendentalist, provides this intriguing insight. The Druids were priests and physicians, curing by magnetism and charging amulets with their fluidic influence. Their universal remedies were mistletoe and serpent's eggs because these substances attract the astral light in a unique manner. The reverence accorded to mistletoe during its harvesting engendered profound public trust in its mystical properties. This trust endowed it with great magnetism. The progression of magnetism will one day unveil the absorbing properties of mistletoe. We will then fathom the enigmatic virtue of those spongy growths that drew forth the dormant virtues of plants and imbued them with tinctures and flavors. Mushrooms, truffles, tree galls, and diverse varieties of mistletoe will find purpose in a medical science that, though ancient, is also new. However, progress in this field should move at the pace of science, which recedes to advance further. Reference, The History of Magic Mistletoe was revered not only for its symbolic representation of a universal panacea but also because it thrived on the oak tree. The Druids venerated the supreme deity through the oak symbol, thus deeming anything that grew upon this tree sacred. During specific celestial alignments, dependent on the sun, moon, and stars' positions, the archdruid would ascend the oak tree to harvest mistletoe. The parasitic plant was caught in dedicated white cloths to prevent contact with the earth and protect it from terrestrial influences. Typically, this ritual also involved the sacrifice of a white bull under the sacred oak. The Druids belonged to an enigmatic order, shrouded in secrecy. This order, bearing striking resemblance to the Bacchic and Eleusinian mysteries of Greece, as well as the Egyptian rites of Isis and Osiris, earned its rightful name as the Druidic Mysteries. Much speculation surrounds the wisdom held by the Druids. Their teachings were never transcribed but instead orally conveyed to meticulously prepared disciples. Robert Brown, a 32nd degree Mason, conjectures that British priests may have obtained their knowledge from Tyrian and Phoenician mariners, who, millennia before the Christian era, established settlements in Britain and Gaul while searching for tin. Thomas Maurice, in Indian Antiquities, expounds on the Phoenician, Carthaginian, and Greek expeditions to the British Isles for the procurement of tin. Other theories suggest that the Druidic mysteries, as celebrated by the Druids, may have originated from the Orient, perhaps with roots in Buddhism. The proximity of the British Isles to the lost continent of Atlantis may provide context for their sun worship, a prominent element in Druidic rituals. According to Artemidorus, 
Ceres and Persephone were adored on an island close to Britain, with rites and ceremonies akin to those in Samothrace. Undoubtedly, the Druidic pantheon featured numerous Greek and Roman deities, a fact that astounded Julius Caesar during his conquests in Britain and Gaul. He asserted that these tribes also venerated Mercury, Apollo, Mars, and Jupiter, reminiscent of the Roman gods. The likelihood is that the Druidic mysteries were not indigenous to Britain or Gaul but rather migrated from ancient civilizations. The Druidic school was compartmentalized into three distinct divisions, each housing a unique body of wisdom. These secret teachings were conveyed orally and reserved for select initiates. An Ovate, Ovid, the lowest division, was an honorary degree, necessitating no specific purification or preparation. Ovates don green attire, the Druidic hue of knowledge, and ideally possess knowledge of medicine, astronomy, poetry, and sometimes music. The Bard, Bayard, the second division, was garbed in sky blue, symbolizing harmony and truth. They bore the responsibility of committing to memory, at least in part, the vast corpus of 20,000 verses of Druidic sacred poetry. Frequently depicted with the archaic British or Irish harp, an instrument strung with human hair and strings equivalent to the human rib count, bards often served as instructors for individuals aspiring to enter the Druidic mysteries. Neophytes, on the other hand, were identified by their striped robes, combining the three sacred colors of the Druidic order, blue, green, and white. The third and highest division was that of the Druid, Derwidden, dedicated to ministering to the spiritual needs of the populace. To attain this prestigious status, a candidate had to first rise through the ranks of bard brain. Druids consistently wore white robes, emblematic of their purity and the solar symbolism they held dear. To ascend to the exalted position of Archdruid, the spiritual leader of the Druidic order, a priest had to progress through the six successive degrees of the Druidic order. These members were distinguishable by the color of their sashes, although all were attired in white. Some contend that the title of Archdruid was hereditary, passed down from father to son, yet it is more plausible that this honor was granted through a ballot election. The recipient was selected for their virtues and conduct. Historian James Gardner suggests that there were typically two Archdruids in Britain, one residing on the Isle of Anglesey and the other on the Isle of Man. It is likely that other such dignitaries existed in Gaul. These esteemed figures frequently carried golden scepters and wore crowns of oak leaves, symbols of their authority. Younger members of the Druidic order were characterized by their clean-shaven countenances and modest dress, while the elder members sported lengthy grey beards and resplendent golden ornaments. The educational system of the British Druids was considered superior to that of their counterparts on the continent, and thus, many Gallic youths were sent to Druidic colleges in Britain for their philosophical tutelage and training. Eliphas Levi attests that the Druids practiced asceticism, focusing on natural sciences, and strictly guarding their knowledge. They admitted new members only after extended periods of probation. Many priests lived in structures reminiscent of modern monasteries, often congregating in ascetic communities. While celibacy was not a mandated lifestyle, it was relatively rare among the Druids. Many retreated from society, living as recluses in caves, stone dwellings, or isolated huts nestled within deep forests. In such sanctuaries, they engaged in prayer and meditation, emerging solely for religious duties. James Freeman Clark, in his work Ten Great Religions, elucidates the beliefs held by the Druids. The Druids believed in three worlds and in transmigration from one to the other, in a world above this, in which happiness predominated, a world below, of misery, and this present state. This transmigration was to punish and reward and also to purify the soul. In the present world, said they, good and evil are so exactly balanced that man has the utmost freedom and is able to choose or reject either. The Welsh triads tell us there are three objects of metempsychosis, to collect into the soul the properties of all being, to acquire a knowledge of all things, and to get power to conquer evil. There are also, they say, three kinds of knowledge, knowledge of the nature of each thing, of its cause, and its influence. There are three things which continually grow less, darkness, falsehood, and death. There are three which constantly increase, light, life, and truth. Like many esoteric schools, the teachings of the Druids were divided into two categories. The simpler aspect, a moral code, was disseminated to the general populace, while the deeper, esoteric doctrines were reserved solely for initiated priests. Candidates for initiation had to hail from respectable families and possess unwavering moral character. 
Access to profound secrets was granted only after successfully withstanding multiple trials and demonstrating unwavering character. The Druids imparted wisdom to the British and Gaulish populations regarding the immortality of the soul. Their beliefs included transmigration and possibly reincarnation. It was believed that one's debts from one life would be repaid in the next. They also held to the notion of a purgatorial kind of hell where sins would be purged before one attained unity with the gods. The Druids conveyed that salvation was attainable by all, but some would need to revisit Earth multiple times to learn the lessons of human existence and overcome their inherent wickedness. Before a candidate was entrusted with the secret doctrines of the Druids, they were bound by a vow of silence. These teachings were only unveiled deep within the forests and the darkness of caves. In such remote settings, far from the habitation of humans, the neophyte was educated on the creation of the universe, the natures of the gods, the laws of nature, the mysteries of celestial bodies, and the rudiments of magic and sorcery. The Druids set aside numerous days for celebrations. Sacred periods included the new moon, the full moon, and the sixth day of the lunar month. Initiations were likely scheduled for the solstices and equinoxes. On the 25th day of December at dawn, the birth of the sun god was observed. The esoteric teachings of the Druids are thought by some to bear the imprint of Pythagorean philosophy. The Druids revered a Madonna, a virgin mother holding a child, significant to their mysteries. Their sun god's resurrection coincided with the time of year that modern Christians celebrate Easter. Both the cross and the serpent held profound significance for the Druids. The former was created by trimming all branches from an oak tree, leaving only a single branch fastened to the main trunk in the form of the letter T. This oak cross represented their supreme deity. The Druids also worshipped celestial bodies, particularly the sun, moon, and stars. The moon occupied a special place in their devotion. Caesar noted that Mercury was among the chief deities of the Gauls. It is believed that the Druids venerated Mercury in the form of a stone cube. Nature spirits, including fairies, gnomes, and undines, entities of forests and rivers, received great reverence, with many offerings made to them. Describing the temples of the Druids, Charles Hechthorn in the secret societies of all ages and countries wrote. Their temples wherein the sacred fire was preserved were generally situate on eminences and in dense groves of oak, and assumed various forms, circular, because a circle was the emblem of the universe, oval, in allusion to the mundane egg, from which issued, according to the traditions of many nations, the universe, or, according to others, our first parents, serpentine, because a serpent was the symbol of who, the druidic Osiris, cruciform because a cross is an emblem of regeneration, or wing to represent the motion of the divine spirit. Their chief deities were reducible to two, a male and a female, the great father and mother, who and Carid when, distinguished by the same characteristics as belong to Osiris and Isis, Bacchus and Ceres, or any other supreme god and goddess representing the two principles of all being. Godfrey Higgins posited that who, the mighty, who was regarded as the first settler of Britain, hailed from a place termed the summer country in Welsh triads, believed to be the present site of Constantinople. Albert Pike even suggested that the lost word of masonry was concealed in the name of the druid god who, the meager records of Druidic initiation suggest a striking similarity with the mystery schools of Greece and Egypt. Who, the sun god, was subjected to a symbolic death, after which he underwent a series of mystic rituals and ordeals before being resurrected. The Druidic mysteries consisted of three degrees, with few candidates successfully traversing all of them. The most arduous ordeal involved being placed in an open boat at sea, an experience that claimed many lives. An ancient scholar, Taliesin, who emerged from the mysteries, has left a description of this boat initiation, detailed in Faber's pagan idolatry. Those who conquered this third degree were believed to be reborn and were granted access to the hidden truth safeguarded by the Druidic priesthood. Many of the prominent figures in the religious and political realms of Britain were chosen from among these initiates. For further reading, consult Faber's pagan idolatry, Albert Pike's morals and dogma, and Godfrey Higgins' Celtic Druids. Thank you for joining us on this adventure today. We hope you enjoyed the content. Don't forget to like, share, and leave a comment below. We love hearing from you. Your support means the world to us. Until next time, take care and keep exploring.